This morning our worship has been all about our wonderful Savior, and this morning as we open up God's Word in our continuing journey from Genesis to Revelation, today we're going to consider the clues that will point us to the conclusion that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the Son of God, and then the clues that will then confirm that we are indeed in Christ. You see, everything up to this point in our journey through God's Word over the past seven months has been pointing to this moment when Christ would minister And even the very one who despises this story anticipated this moment, Satan himself. You see, all throughout the Old Testament story, we can see Satan's attempts to stop this plan in progress. For example, when Satan learned that the Messiah would come through the lineage of one called Abraham, Satan set out at every attempt to try to undermine the life and the impact of Abraham. When God's people were on the verge of being set free from slavery, a picture of redemption, Satan did everything possible through Pharaoh to stop that plan. When God's people were entering into the land where they would be the visible witness of the the presence of God, Satan raised up a a people, the Canaanites, a wicked people that would pull God's people away from uh, following him again and again. Even in the Persian period, Satan raised up Haman, who would set out to try to destroy the Jews, coming all the way up into the New Testament. Satan raised up Herod, who would set out to kill all of the babies that would get rid of this plan of a Messiah. And even at the cross, Satan thought this would be the one thing that would stop this movement. And yet we know from God's Word, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Everything has been leading up to this moment where today it gives meaning to our worship, that we can sing about our wonderful Savior. And so if there are clues to point to this Savior, then I think it's worth our time to investigate those clues, to look and see what does God's Word say about who is this Jesus, and then in response, are there clues that would point to say whether I am indeed in Christ myself? And so as we consider these clues, we're going to look at several this morning. The first one that I would say is this. We're to follow the clues as we eliminate the stumbling blocks. That's the first point. I'm going to invite you to turn to John's Gospel, John chapter 8. A lot of different places in the four Gospels we could look at the life of Jesus. But I want us to focus in on just a few chapters here in John's Gospel. John chapter 8, verse 31, as we eliminate the stumbling blocks. Verse 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. As we look at the, the life of Jesus, there seems to be a key word that he throws out, abide. That's the one word that he he gives as that key to freedom. You see, freedom wasn't going to be found in a teaching. Freedom wasn't going to be found in a movement. It wasn't going to be found in a religious ritual. What he said there is that we're to abide not only in his word, but we abide in him. And so Jesus points everything to himself. He points to a person, Jesus Christ. Now the question that we have to ask then, based on the fact that Jesus pointed to himself is, what clues give us evidence to say that Jesus truly is the long-awaited Messiah? Well, I'm going to read just one verse from Luke's Gospel, Luke 24, 44. Jesus said, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now, the context of this passage is actually after the resurrection. And what Jesus was saying to his followers, his disciples, was this. Everything pointed to this truth, to this reality. You you should have been able to see this because everything leading up to this point pointed to exactly what you saw played out right before you. That's the message that he gave to his disciples. You see, as we look across God's word, we know that his birth, even the birthplace was prophesied in Micah 5. We know in Isaiah 9 that his nature was prophesied, a number of different titles that we receive about Jesus, and even uh, how he would die, and even when he would return. All of these things we find prophesied all throughout the Old Testament, letting us know that all of the evidence has been pointing to Jesus Christ as the fulfillment. But you know, as Jesus gave that word, as he pointed all of the direction to himself, 
that he was the Messiah, what we also realize is that this was a stumbling block. As we think about a stumbling block, what is a, a stumbling block for us? Well, it's really something that gets in the way of us coming to the truth. Now, for these religious leaders, they, they listen to this confession of Jesus Christ, of Him saying that I indeed am the Messiah, and it became a stumbling block because in their, their ideas, their tradition, they said this is getting in the way of us getting to God. And so what was to them a stumbling block in reality was the very truth that He was bringing. So what was the stumbling block? Well, first of all, it was this. They were disputing that Jesus is the only way. That Jesus is the only way. In Acts 4.12, the Bible states, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so Luke uh, gives that clarity as he gives the account of the New Testament church that there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It is Jesus Christ alone. But you know, in our have-it-your-way culture, we like to think there's, there's got to be another way. You've heard the slogan for Burger King, have it your way. It's not a, a new slogan. It started back in 1974 as their slogan for the restaurant. And they've brought that back again as the one motivating slogan for everything that they do. Have it your way. Well, that motivated a math student. He says, all right, have it your way. Then just how many different ways can I have a Whopper sandwich? And so he started researching, started calculating out how many different ways. And so I started thinking, well, probably 25, 30 different ways. He came up with 81,920 different ways that you can have a Whopper. That's have it your way right there. Well, he said, well, that, that doesn't satisfy me. And so he took those 81,920 ways and he says, if I just start reversing the order of the condiments on the sandwich, then he came up with well in excess of 200,000 different ways you can order just a Whopper. Have it your way. We like that. We like to custom order everything. And when it comes to the Messiah, that was the idea surrounding Jesus that day. They wanted a custom order. They wanted it their own way. And so when Jesus came proclaiming the truth, they said, I'll come up with my own combination. What you're saying doesn't agree with what I think. And so they, they said, we'll come up with our own plan. And so saying Jesus is the only way, well, it became a stumbling block. Listen to what we find in 1 Timothy 2.5, this very clear declaration. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You know, as we look at the story here in John chapter 8, we see that they were uh, exalting not the Messiah, not the prophecy of the Messiah, but instead we find their stumbling block was this. They were exalting tradition. Look with me again in John chapter 8, verse 53 down to 59. Verse 53, it says, Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. You know, as Jesus shared those words, he shared a, a disturbing reality to the, the religious elite that day as they listened to his words because his announcement was very clear. Along the same lines, a, a friend invited his old college buddies, to come over and see his brand new condominium. But as they arrived, he informed them that the construction wasn't quite complete. And so they'd have to walk the 60 stories up to his condominium. So to make it an event, as always, they came up with a plan. For the first 20 flights, one of them would tell jokes. For the second 20 flights, one of them would tell happy stories. And then for that final 20 flights, the, the owner of the condominium, he said, why don't you tell some sad stories? Well, they made it up the steps, passed 
40 flights of walking up the stairs and came to the condominium owner's sad story and he began with a real tearjerker. You see, he looked at his friends and weary from climbing from so many stairs, he simply said with a broken-hearted face, Guys, I've got a real sad story for you. I left my keys downstairs in the car. You know, that day, that uh, response, that statement would have definitely elicited a clear response, a real sense of disappointment. And as Jesus made that announcement, he said these words, I am. Let me tell you, folks, those words were known to that Jewish audience. They knew when he said, I am, he was making the statement that I am God. Folks would say today, I I just don't believe that Jesus ever claimed divinity, that he ever claimed that he was God. Well, let me ask you, why did they pick up stones that day then? See, they picked up stones because they were angered. They knew what he was saying, and so they set out to kill this man who was claiming divinity. He was claiming to be God. You know, as we think about that, there are times when uh, a word, a message, stirs up emotion. I think back a few years in 2004, the Clemson and USC rivalry met on the field. And the tension was evident from the outset. The game was a a clash of emotions, as it always is. But in the fourth quarter, on a fourth down attempt, the post-play shoving turned into an all-out brawl. All over the news, a season-changing brawl because they both had to forfeit their end-of-year play. There were very clear emotions in that game. No one would doubt, after you walked away from that game, that there were emotions on both sides. You know, in the story of Jesus here, as he makes this confession, the statement, I am, very clearly there were uh, emotions. Because they understood that by making this statement, he was saying that I am the way. That you couldn't exalt tradition, you couldn't exalt anything else you had to say, either I'm going to deal with who is this Jesus, or I'm going to deny him. Listen to what we find in John chapter 10. Look over just a little bit further there. John 10, verse 1 and 2. Jesus, again, is uh, going against their wrong ideas of who he was. And so he says in John 10, 1, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And what he was saying right there is that he was that way. He was that door. He says actually in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. You know, as we look at these clues in God's Word, I believe we find very clearly the clues saying that Jesus truly is the Messiah. In fact, these are the things that he said. He says that he himself, and he pointed to himself as the door. That's one of the very clear things we see in his Word. But also... He pointed to himself as that one that would open the door. In John 9, 39, he says, I have come into the world that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. You know, as we look at the the clues this morning as to who is this Jesus, Jesus pointed to himself as that door to salvation, that there is only one way. You know, and for the overwhelming majority of you here, you would say, I heard that truth 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, however long it was, and you received Jesus Christ as your Savior. You received Him as that only means to salvation. You trusted in Him. But you know, as we consider that, the question then is, if I know I've received Him, if I believe that Jesus truly is the Messiah, then I think for most of us here, the application in our message this morning is this, What is that evidence that I can see in His Word that would prove that I am in Him? And to see that, I want us to look at our second point. Following the clues, take notes for the journey. If I believe truly today, I would say, I agree with you, Michael. I believe that Jesus is who He said He was. He's the Messiah. Then what are those notes that I could take along the journey to know that I am indeed in Christ? Look there again in John chapter 10, verse 2. We'll pick up and continue in the story there. Jesus said, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers." 
It's been a, a number of years since I've played the game Clue, but from what I remember of the game, it's a process of elimination. Figuring out who is the guilty party and what uh, tool did they use to carry out their crime. And as you go along, you need to take notes of what did you eliminate as the possible person, the possible instrument. And as you take notes, you're guaranteed to lead to that point where you find the guilty party. You name where it happened and everything. You know, as we look at the story here, we can see there's evidence that he's laid out for us. He gives this illustration here of, of sheep and a door and Everything is pointing to Jesus Christ. And so if I believe that He is the Messiah, then what are those words of confirmation that we, will, we find in His Word that would help me to know that indeed? Well, one that I see is this. God offers to each of us the confirmation that we are God's children. See, verse 3 says, The sheep hear His voice, and the sheep follow Him, for they know His voice. One of the classic studies that I think has uh, helped my own faith more than any uh, other study has been experiencing God. And in that study, we find this promise that, that God does speak, and He speaks through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church, and He does it for a reason, to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. And so we can know that if I am a child of God, then God speaks. You say, well, I, I don't hear God. I don't hear an audible voice. I pray, God, would you just tell me very clearly what I need to do? And we don't realize also that the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church are all tools that God uses in order to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. And so, what does God do to confirm that I am indeed a child of God? Well, He speaks to us. He confirms that we are God's children. You know, as we think about just those uh, notes of confirmation, things that we jot down, we find these promises. Like Paul said in Romans 8, 16, he said, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know, one of the greatest promises that we have in God's Word is that as Jesus was resurrected, as He ascended into heaven, the promise was that there would be one that would come after Him, a comforter, one that would be a guide for us, the Holy Spirit. And so as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that we have God's Spirit within us that guides us day by day. And Paul said, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. But you know, another confirmation I think we find in His Word is that God offers to each of us the confirmation that we're in His will. Look again at John 10, it says, The sheep follow Him, for they know His voice. In other words, when we hear His voice, we know the directions. We know exactly where to go. There once was a young lady that lived in a small house on the corner with a small shed in the backyard. Well, one day she uh, thought she saw smoke coming out of the roof of the shed. So in a panic, she dialed 911. They answered and said, 911, what's your emergency? The young lady replied, uh, yes, sir, my building out back is on fire. The 911 operator replied, don't panic, help is on the way. Now, where do you live? The young lady replied, well, I live in the house. Now hurry. The 911 operator calmly responded back, Ma'am, how are we supposed to get there? To which the lady replied, I guess in a big red truck. Folks, you've got to give the directions. You know, as we walk through God's Word, as we've walked through this story, we've seen the directions. We've seen again and again those clues that have pointed us to Jesus Christ, that He truly is the Messiah. And so when we think about how do I know that He is the Messiah, we see those evidences. How do I know I am His? He confirms it again and again. God offers us, thirdly, He confirms in us when we're also straying from Him. God offers us the clue to when we are straying from Him. In John 10, 5, He says, Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from Him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Folks, once we understand that Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah, then we have the promise in His Word that He will convict us of sin when it's pulling us away from Him, when our lives are not in alignment with His will. Listen to Galatians 5.16. Paul said, I say then, walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What are those notes for the journey? For us as followers of Christ, 
Well, that's when we come to God's Word on a daily basis and we say, is my life lining up with who you long for me to be, God? Does my life line up with those clues in your Word that would confirm that I am indeed yours? And if that's the case, then I believe we see our third clue this morning. As believers in Christ, as followers of Christ, we can then experience the victory. We can experience the victory. Look with me there again in John chapter 10, verse 7. We'll pick up our story. Jesus, the good shepherd, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You know, as we look at this promise in God's Word, what we see is that we can experience the victory. Last summer we went uh, to the beach and it was one of those typical sun, uh, summer rainy days and trying to figure out, all right, what's the backup plan? So we went to the mall and we decided we were going to let our kids get on one of those bungee jump rides and, you know, we got up to it, and we thought, well, this will be a lot of fun. And then he told us the price, and we said, this won't be fun. We're not doing this. But he could see we were kind of hesitant, so he started dealing. Well, how, how about we do this? How, how about you do this, and I'll, I'll give you this? And he kept wheeling and dealing and lowering the price. And finally he said, look, I'll, I'll let you do the bungee ride, and then afterward your kid can climb the rock wall too, and here's your prize. I said, hey, I like it now. Let's do it. You know, as there that day, he could tell my hesitation, and he said, let me throw in a bonus for you. You know, as I look at God's Word, I think what we see there is that promise of a bonus. That as we receive Him as our Lord and Savior, He says, and I want to give you something, and that Word was abundant life. It's kind of the picture of saying, I'm going to take a, a bottle of water and a glass here, and I'm going to fill it up with all of my needs. But God says there's a little bit more than that. You see, He's going to keep on filling it. Till that water starts running over, that's that picture of abundant life that in Christ we have all of our meads net. Every, everything that we could long for we can find in Christ, but he says it is so much more. We have abundant life. So what's promised in God's Word? Well, we're promised protection. Choosing Christ protects us eternally. Our text says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. If you go a little, a little further in John 10, you'll discover this promise as well. In verse 27 and 28, he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. We have a promise in God's Word that if I truly do believe He's the Messiah, if I am indeed in Christ, then we have so much more of this promise to us. He says, nothing can snatch you from His hand. He protects us eternally. But you know, also what we find is choosing Christ protects us daily. He says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You know what that picture is? It's a picture of daily protection, of that daily relationship with Christ. Folks, when I receive Christ, it's not a one-time event where I simply come forward, receive Him, and say, Thanks, see you in heaven, Lord. No, it's a daily relationship Well, of going in and out and finding pasture with Him. Folks, I hope that your relationship with the Lord is that abundant life that God promised in His Word of coming in and out and finding pasture with Him, knowing Him on a daily basis. He protects us daily. But also, choosing Christ protects us relationally. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You see, as I find that pasture, I find out there's some other sheep. I find out that I'm not alone in this journey. That as I trust in Christ, he has blessed us with an opportunity to be right here at NRE Baptist Church with a fellowship of believers. I hope that's a good thing for you. I hope it's a wonderful thing to know that as I come in a pasture that, that God has saved me, He's brought me into His fellowship of believers, that I now have the opportunity to grow in my walk with Him among all of these believers. And so when I struggle, you stand beside me. When you struggle, I get to help you carry those burdens. As I choose Christ, He gives us those blessings of abundant life, of protecting us relationally. You know, as we've moved through these uh, weeks through the Bible, 25 weeks now of walking through the story 
We're talking about seven months of walking through God's Word, and what I hope that we've achieved is the realization that it's not an intellectual journey. If you now know a whole lot of kings and you know some prophets and know stories, then we've done it all in vain because everything has been in the, for the purpose in God's Word of pointing us to this moment of saying, Who is this Jesus? It's the, to point everyone to the hope of salvation found in Him. It's to remind us of the, the blessing of walking with Christ daily. But you know, the response of the crowd that day was drastic. It was obvious. It was emotional. They heard the claims of Jesus saying, I am. In other words, pointing to Himself. And when, when Jesus was speaking to the crowd, He says, I don't understand why you're missing the message. I'm, I'm giving it to you rather clearly. As he said to his disciples, everything should have pointed them to Jesus. But you know, as we receive Jesus, we also realize there is the blessing of an abundant life, a daily relationship with him. Listen to what Jesus said again. He says to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let me ask you this morning, do you feel free? Do you feel like you've been freed up, that all of the weight of your sin and the, the weight of all of your struggles has just been set free? Well, if not, the question is, what's missing? Is, is it a relationship with Christ? Because if you trust in Christ, the promise is that He will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The promise in John 10 is that offer of abundant life, overflowing life. And so what's missing? Is it a relationship with Christ? If it's not that, then, is it confession? Is it saying, Lord, I've, I've trusted in you as my Savior, but I've forgotten one key thing. It's a daily relationship, and I need to come and confess to you today that I have areas in my life where I need to, to submit this to you so that I once again can claim that promise, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What was that key word? Big red picture I put up earlier. Abide. It's abiding. It's daily living in Him a relationship of knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior. Everything has pointed to Christ. As we work through this story series, the one mark where we gauged everything was placing Easter as that one story we were building up to. That's why we've done each message as we've done over the past seven months. And I hope that in your heart there's been a real sense of building up and understanding why Christ came and the great significance of Easter that in Him we finally can say we are redeemed, we're set free from our sin. Jesus Christ is exactly who He said He was and He delivers exactly what He promised, life, abundant life for each and every one of us. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You that in Your Word we find...